Your studio sort of looks like mine. Yeah, I, uh, I, I uh, like to surround myself with as much stuff as possible. My little, my little museum of me. Now, your wife has a studio too in the same house, right? Or yeah, we're actually in a separate building now. We built a, we had a building built. We didn't a building built. We um, we had this built about two years ago. It's a uh, like twenty by forty feet. Most of it's her studio, about three quarters of it is, and I, I have a, a room in the corner. So okay. she's, cera she's a ceramicist, so it, she she uh, she needs quite a bit more space than me. Is that just good so you can get out of the house? Is that why? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you, you probably know how it is. It's just uh, so many years of living in apartments and houses and uh, always, always having to have my desk in my bedroom. Yep. Uh, I never really felt that separation of uh, of work and uh, private life. So to have the separate space and finally get to the point where we can have a separate space for it, it's uh, it just helps. It helps me put put my work behind me for the day. Even though I tend to you know keep thinking about things, it's just not. If I have a drawing board next to my bed, I tend to go up and start filling with drawings, and I never really leave it behind me. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, especially now with the. Yeah, especially now with the kids, I, I need a I need to find a way to you know make sure I I give the appropriate amount of time to family as well. I just got this one from them. Uh, this guy Nathan Calgary. Have you read this one yet? Seen I've seen. It? I haven't seen it. I, I mean, I haven't read it. I've seen it promoted. Dude, it's way too funny for 2021. I'll say that much. <laughs> I'm reading it. I'm like, oof. Do you want to say that? Oh, do you want to draw that? Oh no. <laughs> You know, I had like a, a circle of cartoonists that people identified me with, which is like, I always hung out with John P, mm -hmm. with Zach Sally, you know, and it's like these guys, I feel like you didn't have, you never had like a wolf pack of your own, man. You're always kind of like a lone, like a, a lonesome cartoonist. Yeah. And I, you know, no, no man is an island, but I think it just stems from growing up, no growing up in a rural area. I'm, I'm accustomed to it. I do have close cartoon, cartoonist friends, a, course, a few guys yeah. from Kansas City. Uh, you may know Daniel Spotswood. Um, oh yeah, of course. Think, yeah, yeah. yeah Dan, Dan's Dan and a couple other guys, uh, Travis Fox, Hector Casanova, some guys from KC. Uh, since so, since I lived in Kansas City for a few years, I was kind of we kind of had a little core group where we we get together and draw. But I was only living in Kansas City for four or five years, so that didn't last very long. We're, we we're, we're lifelong friends. We're still in touch, but you know, in Chicago, I was with Trouble uh, Trouble Club. Oh, you were? I didn't know that you were part of that. Yeah, I was part of trouble. I wasn't a, I wasn't a founding member, but uh, Lily Correa invited me along maybe a year or so after they started. So uh, my last couple of years in Chicago, I was part of Trouble Club. But as far as like guys I can always reach out to and share comics ideas and stuff with, I and especially since I've moved back to Northwest Missouri, I, I, I'm probably the only cartoonist within 100 miles. Uh, uh, so I just, I don't really have that, that sense of like, I guess like you, how you referred to it as having a wolf pack. A wolf pack. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, you weren't like I, touring with like, there weren't like cartoonists that you're always tabling with, you know. You, no, you I always kind of, with. there's a part of me that always wanted that, but it's not something that can be forced, you know, it's uh, yeah. nothing was, much I can do about it. Who was in Trouble Club? It was L Laura Park was a part of that, right? Laura, Laura was part, Jeremy Tinder, uh, Grant Reynolds, Nate Beatty, uh, were some of the core members, Lily. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. Then anytime a cartoonist would come through town, someone would be in touch with him. So Jeffrey yeah. Brown uh, participated sometimes. I think even Ivan maybe came once. Ivan Bernetti. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Craig Thompson came, and whoever would pass through town could uh, join in. But there was the core group like Laura and uh, Jeremy Tinder, Brett Reynolds, people like that. Solid. Fucking solid group of yeah, it was a it was a great up you know every sunday we would get together we'd drink some beer and uh, just draw for a few hours and and talk talk shop and it was it was really great and most of the uh apartments i went to were were like ours our studios they were just uh 
crammed with stuff. So there is always uh, a lot of stuff to check out. And it was, um, it, it gave me a great sense of community, something I didn't have much of before and something I do. There are aspects of that that I miss uh, having moved back to a rural area. I, yeah. I don't have I know, I know the comics community is there and, and in the past year and a half, it's one of the things I've missed most, the opportunity to go to shows and get back in touch with that community. Uh, being a cartoonist, you know, with isolation is a part of it. Uh, so you have to, you know, stick your head out every now and then and get in touch with people. Uh, but it's, uh, there hasn't been a lot of that lately and I, and I, I definitely miss it. How, how rural are you right now? Uh, the mile away from the nearest town, it's the nearest town is Barnard. There's two, like 200 people plus or minus in that town. Then the big town in the county is 10,000. Well, it used to be 10,000. It's like 13,000 now. We have, it's, you know, they have McDonald's and a grocery store pretty much. Uh, but uh, my nearest neighbors are my my folks and they live about a quarter mile south of here. Uh, yeah. So we live that, on an 80, 80 acre farm. So you have to go all the way out to the grocery store and it's like a big to do we go yeah you make you make like one trip a week every week or two during the during the pandemic uh not to speak as if it's over but we uh usually we just go out get th two or three weeks worth of groceries and we have a basement so we were able to keep a lot of it down there and uh otherwise we weren't leaving the farm i'm doing it leaving a little more now uh, but now that the delta variant is uh spreading we're, we're starting to hold up a little bit more even though we're vaccinated the kids aren't and it's it's still a concern did you have a child when you lived in Chicago? No, I didn't. Uh, I, I just started dating Momoko in Chicago. Uh, okay. And then we moved back and built the house. And then um, and then I think like a week after we finished building the house, Koji was born. And was she uh, um, kind of like, uh, we're going to move to to the a farm? Was she like a little freaked out by that or? Well, it was something we talked about a lot. When we, uh, when we lived in Chicago, we knew we wanted to leave uh, before too long and our options were we whittled it down to moving here. And uh, this was this was one of the options because we wanted to be able to focus on our work full time. Uh, whereas in Chicago, you know, we were getting older working 40 plus hour week jobs and the energy you have after work wasn't, or I had after work wasn't really enough to accomplish much more comics wise anymore. Uh, so we were getting to a point where we needed to go somewhere where we could focus on on what we you know if we're prioritizing putting art as a priority I, I we wanted to put as much effort into art as we could so it was either this where it would be affordable to do that or uh, move to kyoto where we uh where she's well she's from kobe but she had a, an apartment in kyoto so we um we were thinking about both of those and then um we had a the people who lived below us in chicago they had an apartment fire and it uh, burned, burned, burned out their apartment entirely, and it the fire moved into ours. And uh, you know, we lost electronics and things, but nothing, nothing big. But we were kind of forced to decide right then uh, where we were going to go. And we considered uh, Japan, but uh, I we weren't married, so I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to get a, a work visa without sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And um, we just decided to move back here. And uh, we talked. To, I, I I know what to expect here. I mean the. I, uh, we talked it over quite a bit and I was like, it's, uh, I, I knew what to expect, but she, she growing up in cities in Japan, I knew it'd be entirely different for her, but I kept asking her, even when we were like getting ready to build the house, I was like, are you sure, are you sure you want to do this? And she, uh, she, she went for it. And, you know, 10 years later, um, we're still, we're still doing well. And, uh, she's, she, she does better here than me sometimes, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it seems so classic to leave yeah, home, you know, start a family or like leave home, meet, um, get your wife and then bring them <laughs> back to like the like your ancestral land. Or something. You know, it's, it's kind totally, of yeah, it's, it's like a, a <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of what it turned out being like from an outside point of view is a little it was a little more it was a little more uh, organic in the relationship. But yeah, it looks like I went I left, found a wife and brought her back and uh <laughs> it uh it definitely looks like that but we're we're happy you know it's like we, we're achieving what we wanted to do we 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 have a family we're able to work every day we're both very productive and yeah and um uh, it's it's worked out well but that's, although it, it, that's that's you know that's what success as an artist is like that's what i feel i finally found a balance in my life and momoko has too where um we're we're, we're doing what we want to do and that's a really good feeling you know it's yeah a, 
did that give you a lot of anxiety early on this like feeling of, oh like, that, the absolutely yeah because it's it just like like anything that's unknown you know it's yeah. uh i didn't know how it was going to work out and i was i was nervous bringing a uh a, a japanese woman to a predominantly white area and this is before the past decade happened you know and i'm, I'm even more nervous about it now even though most people are fine in the community there there are the militia types around here the you know it's uh and the proud boy types and it, it, make, it makes me it still makes me nervous uh, um but that you know that's a whole other conversation would, would you I, would you murder another man for your child if i had to yeah i, I would rather i'm a pacifist so i'd rather not kill anybody but i figured if i had if i envision myself in a in a situation of self defense, yeah. I think I, if it came to it, I think I would, you know, if I had to, to protect my family. Like, if you saw a stranger uh, harming your child, do you think you would just see red, and then the next oh, thing you would you would come to, and you just be cut with blood all over your hands? And, uh, and I, would, I would be I would be cuffed and in the Nottaway County Jail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I and think he, about that a lot, man, because I'm like already because I don't even know my child yet, but I already love him. You know, I, I can oh, put my hand on my white stomach and I can feel him moving around and stuff. He's getting really big. And I think now, like, I would, mur I think I would murder somebody, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I, especially if someone was physically threatening my child, I would do whatever I could to stop them. And that feeling, this is another, uh, whenever your child is born, uh, and I've heard other people say this too, and it, I didn't, I didn't understand it until it actually happened to me. The moment, the moment my son came out of uh, Momoko, you know, uh, I, I felt a click like a, in my head, I was like, this, this is a, this is a person that they are my responsibility and I, I, I have to take care of them. And words, words don't do it justice because there was just this sense like this, this, this creature is my, is my only, my sole responsibility right now. So and, yeah, at that moment though, do you, do you think is there where you go like, okay, I have two choices. I can double down on, on comics and take this really seriously. Um, or I can, now's the moment where I put this aside and, and think about something else. No, the, whenever I was, whenever Koji was born, I was actually still in the period where I wasn't making comics after building the house and everything. I, I, I'd gone about two and a half years without hardly even drawing. Uh, I was wondering if I was even going to be able to do comics again. I just, I felt after Driven by Lemons, uh, I was working on Not Away, but after the fire, it, it, it just, it threw me off. I'm a, I'm OCD. So not having a home and having something like that, that, that much out of your control really had a negative effect on my mind. And I had difficulty accomplishing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but after Koji was born, I, I taught a bit at the uh, local school. I taught art. And then um, actually I, 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 after he was born, uh, I, uh, I was like, okay, I, I, we're running out of money. I, I, I had some money saved up. I, we were living on, it's like, I need to get a job. And uh, the only thing I had available, uh, really around here was there, there's a factory up in Maryville that uh, nearby that that made lawnmower parts so I I, I applied there and I, I I took the job and after a day there and it was the one of the most miserable jobs I'd ever experienced factory factory work anyways miserable but that place was extra miserable mm -hmm. and at the end of the shift I was like okay I can either go back here every day or I can try to start making comics and, and make it work mm -hmm. um and I came home and I called him the next day and I, I told him I quit and I got my notebooks back out and it was a slow process getting back into it. But it, if anything, it just helped me, it helped me uh, prioritize to, wow. you know, to make sure I was like, it, it really opened up my eyes. I was like, okay, now, now's the time I'm either going to do this or I'm going to be just some guy in a factory for the rest of my life. Which, you know, if, if people have to do that to make it work, I, I, it always sounds when I speak like that, I'm being critical of, you know. No, 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 no. There's nothing, I mean, you know, any way that you bring in, that anybody's bringing in money is totally legit. Yeah, you got to make a living, you know, as it's, uh, but uh, it, it, it straightened me out. And I, I started working on volume one, like a few days later. <laughs> so you had just been writing Not Away at that time? Uh, after Drone by Lemons came out in 2009, I, I started writing Not Away seriously. And I worked on it for almost exactly a year. Mm -hmm. And I was getting to the point in my sketchbook where I was, I had all the characters figured out. I even had it figured out. I was, I was gonna need seven volumes to tell the story. So I was getting to the point where I was going to start writing volume one when the fire, uh, when the apartment fire happened. And that just, that was 2010. And it, it was a little over two years had passed before I 
could even return to my sketchbooks. But you know, I, I moved down here. It takes us a year to build a house. Uh, then Koji was born, so it was a couple months after he was born that I started. I I started like realizing that I needed to I needed to figure it out how to make it work. Was there a moment that that ha something that happened that inspired the entire that was like the spark that became the the, the big story of Not Away? The vo the moment where I started thinking about it seriously, I and I can't tell you the article. Uh, it was it was back when the internet was wasn't quite what it is today, but I came across an article where they. It was like a scientific American article or something where they were talking about how someday the human mind would be transferable to a hard drive mm. and uh, in a sense uh, offer offer people immortality. And I was like, well, if that if they can transfer consciousness, then that means consciousness is, you know, you can you can digitize it. If you can digitize it, that means you can send it over the Internet. You can do you know, you can put it on a flash drive and hand it to somebody. And it just got me to thinking like that if consciousness is, can be converted to zeros and ones um that opens up all sorts of uh possibilities as far as ideas go and it got it, that article specifically was the impetus that got that got my uh, my brain going on it and you in the first volume came out in 2016 mm -hmm. have you like extrapolated how old you will be by the time you're finished all seven volumes of not away <laughs> it took me six years to do volume two but that's because it's like almost 400 pages and to oh do any god it is 370 yeah so to do any kind of comic that size especially when it takes me like 16 hours a page to pencil and draw ink it's uh it's gonna take a long time but it's i knew going into volume two that it was going to be the longest because essentially it's like three graphic novels you know together yeah. and the next volumes are going to be closer to volume one in size or maybe even a little shorter I just kind of had to get this uh, this big story out of the way, to, well, not out of the way, but you know, I had I had I, this was the hump I had to get over, and yeah. I the, if I I'm still estimating the series is going to be about 1,800 pages, and I've finished 600 of them uh, at this point, so I'm really a third of the way through. So if I started 2012, eight years, that means 16 more years. So that means when I'm 60, if I uh, still have hands and eyes and everything else, functional hands and eyes and everything, then I'm, I'm hoping by the end of my 50s, I'll be wrapping it up. <laughs> that's so cool though man to have like a project like that that's just like becomes your your life you know it drives you i i need it i need something like that uh and i i wouldn't have necessarily chosen such a big project just but it, after skyscrapers i i really hit a wall i i i, I slipped into a terrible depression I, it's like postpartum i is i is how i describe it you know it's like i finished something and i just it's kind of like you run off a cliff and you just keep trying to run and there's there's no there's no ground there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, I knew this time that when I started writing in 2009, I, I saw an opportunity to do a large story that I felt would be worth spending a third of my life on. And uh, I knew it also would keep me from, you know, hitting that hitting that wall or going off that cliff or whatever analogy you want to use. But I don't know what's going to happen when I finish when I'm 60. Uh, I, that's going to be a pretty, uh, pretty big. Tired. Yeah, but I, I can't worry about that right now, you know. And yeah. I, but it was partially by design doing a large project, uh, because it, it's better for my mental health if I have something I can just focus on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I. It's, totally worked, it's worked for like nine years so far, so you know yeah. it's, it's it's working so far. Not to say I don't get down, but I, those those depths aren't as are, aren't as great as they uh, as they once were. The Spanographics, do they know that this is a seven volume? Yeah, yeah. Eric was like, "Yeah, let's do it." <laughs> I was surprised. I I, I, I wasn't even going to show them the book. I wasn't even thinking about showing the book uh, until you you and I remember you and Zach at Cake. Uh, you kept encouraging me to. So, and I just after that, I just happened to be standing in line next to Jack, waiting for literal cake. Uh, and uh, she asked me what I was working on. And I was like, well, actually, no one's Zach said I should show you. So uh, I did. And it's just kind of rolled from there. And uh, they they seem into it. I know I know it's a, a big investment for the publisher to to take a risk on a seven volume series. But um, Eric's Eric's been Eric and everybody else there. They've been nothing but supportive so far. And, you know, they no, you know, even if I was like the last book took six years and two years more than I expected, um, 
it's they were like no hurry you know just do your thing and that's what i really like about working with independent publishers money isn't such an issue deadlines aren't such an issue because there's not as much wrapped up in it with all the promotion and everything it's just as an independent cartoonist i i take as i take the time i need i put the effort into it that i need to and uh, get the finished product that i'm aiming for rather than rushing something at the end to make sure that you know it meets it meets whatever specific deadline are, are they going to reprint the the first volume or they have they they reprinted the first volume uh a lot, a lot when they were printing the second so uh oh, i'm not cool. sure what kind of run they did but yeah they're they're uh, they're going to keep it in print and everything that's great man yeah you're really fortunate i mean you know you have a publisher that's going to support you through that whole series and it's you're sort of like the you're like the george r, r. martin of a uh, graphic novel right now <laughs> where you're, you're building this whole fantasy world and people are going to be wed like ready for the last volume and then you're just going to dip out and not do it and no yeah i'm just i'm just going to disappear <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's definitely a, that i mean i guess the martin stuff is definitely in my head like at what point uh, maybe if i come to a point where i'm not able to I mean, I'm getting older. You know how it is. You, I, well, I don't know if you know how it is. You're such a prolific bastard. But I, uh, I, I'm not as I'm not as uh, I'm productive, but not as much as I was when I was younger. I don't think so. I, I worry about. I mean, I, I I worry about like how you know if 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 I'm already getting to this point in my 40s, like in my 50s, like how 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 slow am I going to get? But I'm just going to keep pushing. I can't think about that too much. You know, I just got to keep doing it. I wonder if you're gonna. Do you have any like I, I plans to do something in between? Uh, like if you put it together like a diary comic or something like that that you just put out. I have I have been working on things, uh, just personal projects. Like I, while I'm working on these books, I, I think like oh I would love to do this, but I I can't because I want to keep pushing on the book, or I could, but I I tend to get distracted easily, so I make myself stay away from distractions. Yeah. Uh, but I've been doing. I've been doing little paintings and drawings and sketchbook stuff on the side. Like I, I knew, I knew I've been having so many problems like processing the last few years of social change and stuff. So I even, you may have seen some of this. I've even started doing, cause I was getting pretty low and I knew like, well, driven by lemons uh, made me feel better about what I was going through. And this is, this is where I've stopped. I've only got about 10 pages done, but uh it's uh, it's in the vein of Driven by Lemons, uh, where I, I'm not in the same psychological state mm -hmm. as I was then. But depression, I, I have, I've said I haven't been that low, but I've still, I've still dealt with depression, and I find that working on stuff like this helps me work my way out of it. I've been feeling better, and of course, I, I tend to do less in the book when that's the case. So it's something I just plan to return to when mm -hmm. I kind of need to work through problems. And comics are really a, like that for me. It's it's a it's a way of problem solving on paper. Uh, yeah, that would be even, cool to do like a little Fanographics Underground edition of like that kind of weird. Yeah, you know, yeah with Fanographics or whoever might be interested in it. Now that, now that Chris is closing up shop uh, and Driven by Lemons has been out of print for like a year or two, year a year I think now anyway. So, you know, it's a book I would like to keep in print, but then again, it doesn't have a huge audience. So what, what, what why would what incentive does a publisher have to print something like that i mean chris chris was taking a you know a leap by publishing it in the first place uh and it you know it printed a couple thousand copies and we sold them and i'm, I'm happy with how it went and I, it's a book i would like to keep out there but how practical is that i don't know but um it's a you know even if like a book like this the sketchbook even if it never gets published it's still a way of me working through you know problems that i that yeah. i have uh, obstacles in life that I can't quite wrap my brain around. How many sketchbooks was uh, given by Lemons uh, in re in reality? How many was it drawn in? Just one? It was just one. Uh, um, the oh. the plan was after I did it, I got it over here in the corner uh, in my in a glass case. The glass book is just a facsimile of a real sketchbook. We, yeah, Chris and I once once I showed it to Chris, his uh, his idea was like let's just reproduce it as closely as possible. I think the only thing that wasn't on it was the. The moleskin black band that holds it together and i think we even looked into doing that but it wasn't cost effective um but uh, yeah we uh we tried to make it as close a facsimile of the original as possible you know i gotta i gotta say that i think that now it would do better because there is so much more interest in exploring and talking about mental health uh that i feel like yeah, it would be more successful now than it was when, when it came out which was you know if it was to be reissued then yeah i mean because 
I, I, the reason I, I talk openly about mental health, because I, there's so much stigma wrapped up in it. Mm -hmm. And I think people tend to think that when you talk about depression and stuff, you're, 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 you're trying to get attention for yourself. But really, I'm just trying to talk about it and normalize it. And a book like Driven by Lemons, yeah, I, I think the people that have contacted me after reading the book are like, I've, I've had similar problems. And this is very, very close to the experience I had, you know, and people, people thank me for making it. And that means a lot to me as an artist. I think it's what any many artists uh, strive for is making that kind of connection with people and if you can make make life a little bit easier for others then that then that's i consider that to be a success you know and yeah yeah, yeah and so and it's been good these this past decade especially uh to to see the conversations about mental health uh becoming more common and people being a little more open about it of course you're getting the backlash you're getting uh, you're getting the people who you know like you know uh, suck it up you know pull up your pull up your pull up your bootstraps kind of talk mm -hmm. but it's just it's not how mental health works it's a debilitating it's if I was bleeding from the eyes and ears then people might take it seriously but because it's in my head they can't comprehend what I'm personally experiencing and what people with mental health issues are experiencing so to put it on paper I, it definitely helped me and to know that it helped other people uh was beneficial to others uh is 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 uh validating for me uh yeah um but I don't know it's also such a it's also such a dense book. I, I don't know if I don't think I'll ever find a wider audience. Um, yeah, than it already has, you know, I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. And any publisher would have to take a, that chance and not many publishers beyond like ad house or possibly fanographics will be willing to take that chance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, was skyscraper of the Midwest your first comic? Or did you do stuff before then? My first I started self-publishing with a book called Fun. It was a three-part series, 24 pages each. The first comic I ever made was Fun. I didn't even start small, like with like one panelers or three panelers or anything. I just I, I decided I was going to make a make 72 pages worth of comics and see what happened. And uh, it was it was very much the effort of a person trying to figure out the medium. And uh, and I've never uh, seen those before. Did you self-publish them? I self-published. They were, yeah. I, uh, I worked at a place uh, uh, where I was a production artist, and while while people went on lunch break, I would sneak into the coffee room and <laughs> and make coffees. And they would always jam on me, so I'd always be panicking. My boss would come in, so I'd be in there like taking apart the coffee machine, trying to get it get it sorted out before I got caught. But I never got caught, and I, it yielded like fifty copies of each. So I think three issues, fifty copies each. I gave them to, like friends and uh, family, and I sold a few in like record shops and comic shops in Kansas City. And that's actually what led to me being contacted by the KC Star uh, to start working for them. I was a weekly cartoonist for them for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I, I don't think I would ever reprint it. Like, I'm sure you felt that with Blamo, uh, oh, yeah. yearly issues. It's a little awkward putting that stuff yeah, out there. Definitely. Not to say that your work is awkward, but no, it is. It is. early <laughs> stuff. And it, it, I think the notes, and I, 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 I picked that up from Dan. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, in the notes in the back, I, you know, that I, I think that was a, a great way to go about it, like explain yourself. I'm not, I'm not this angry or negative anymore. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I think I would have to have a book's worth of like explaining the book that came before it in order for me to put something like that out there. And it's just not worth it because fun, I mean, it was an experiment. It was me trying to figure things out, but it's, it's not worth, it's not worth publishing. Yeah. Uh, well, I kind of had to do that with Blamo because I, because Blamo is still an ongoing series. I'm still, I'm going to put out a new issue soon. Sure, I saw. So I'm like, and people are like, well, yeah, but they want to get all the material. They're going to start jumping in on a series. They want to get all of it. I, I literally cannot look at this story. I don't. I was, I was, I was similar when Chris decided to uh, publish uh, the collection of the Kansas city star stuff is like yeah. out of, out of a, uh, I don't even know how many strips I did. I did it weekly for like five years. So I guess there may be 300 strips. There were probably only a third of those were actually reproduced because some of them were either too topical or too region, you know, specific to the region yeah. were just flat out bad, you know? Yeah. And I was, like, I was like, there's no sense in reproducing this. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I yeah would, same. And I was I also a weekly, I didn't, I, I forgot that you were a weekly cartoonist for a while. Whether the, the work, the work didn't really you know, I was just in the Kansas City Star and it's it was the third largest newspaper in the country at the time. Uh, so a lot of people saw it, but 
not a lot of people that know my comics probably. Um, so uh, it was great to have an audience and it was great to have that kind of deadline. And really that, that deadline forced me to make something every week, regardless if I had the energy for it or not. Uh, it does a lot for you just doing the work, you know, and if I'm sure you, I'm sure you feel the same way. Like if a younger cartoonist approaches me at a show and asks, how do I, how do I, you know, do this? You know, how do I, how do I break into the indie comic scene? Uh, it's just, you do it, you know, it's just yeah. produce as much as you can. Yeah. Look at the bad stuff, try to understand why it's bad and don't do that again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and your, your stuff will improve. Well, so I, I've been on record as saying, my weekly strip paid me $50 in the beginning. And then I did it for seven years. And by the end of it, I was up to $75. How, how much money did you get a week? <laughs> it was a full color strip. It took me about 10 hours to do every week. Mm -hmm. And I think I got 200 a month. So uh, $50 a strip. And it actually, I think it actually may have gone down a bit towards the end because the star was running was running into budget issues and i was like i want to keep doing the strip i don't care just you know pay me whatever it wasn't at that point it wasn't even a well even with 200 bucks a month you know for 40 hours worth a week that's you know well below minimum wage so that's 1970s uh, money that's what they were paying yeah. in the 70s <laughs> never, never so it definitely happened. wasn't it definitely wasn't about the income you know and and i, and I think that's as an as an artist or a cartoonist uh that's something you have to keep in mind, especially starting out. It's uh, and not just exposure. I, I, I don't. I wouldn't take a job like. Well, I can. I can get down to. I, we can talk about exposure jobs later. I've had a few of those offers to be great for exposure type things. But, uh -huh. but this was my own conscious decision. I was like, this is a way for me to work every week with a news in a medium which I've always been passionate about, and uh, money's not an issue for me. You know, it's like yeah. they're like, hey, here's a space. Here's fifty bucks per for the space each week. Do what you wanna. And I had an editor that. Towards the end of my run, I was getting towards Driven by Lemons and I was having some pretty, pretty serious psychological problems. And they got really, in hindsight, they got pretty experimental and strange. And he, he stuck by me to the end. Hmm. Um, I was always grateful for that. And you were young, too, at the time. So $50 is a lot more. Yeah, I mean, and I had, a, I had at that time I was out of college. I went, to, I went to school to study illustration, but I graduated and I found a, a production artist job in a position in Kansas City. And it was kind of a painful, mindless job, but it, it paid me some money more than I'd ever made in my life. You know, I was like, I was making like 12 bucks an hour and I was just, I felt rich, you know, yeah. after years of delivering pizza and washing windows or whatever else I had to do, I was wealthy. So 200 bucks is just, you know, it's just something else, something extra that I could, I could uh, buy some extra CDs at the end of the day. Totally. Cause I, I, when I, you know, I, I never had a real job. I worked at Panera Bread and Einstein Brothers forever. And I think when I quit Panera Bread, I probably made nine seventy five an hour there. So then I, but I also had my strip, which was seventy five dollars a week. So like those, you know, it, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then like whatever other money I could get from my cartooning, like I would do, like I would, I would go out and do like a comics reporting on like different openings and things like that around town for the paper, and just try to get a little bit extra money that way. But you know, I was broke. Oh, and also I worked at. Uh, now I'm pulling together all my income. <laughs> I also worked every Sunday at Kilgore Books. So oh, yeah, that's that was, that your connection with Kilgore. Yes, yeah, so that was like seventy-five dollars a day just to work there on Sunday. That was the same uh, thing in my early twenties. I was just doing whatever I could yeah. besides this other job. I was, uh, you know, whatever I could do to really make 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 it so I could have the rent to pay for the shelter of my head so I could make comics. <laughs> yeah, 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 and I just pulled it together. But I mean, it's like I eventually i uh was my hours i just kept cutting my hours down at panera bread every every month or so because I, I needed less and less money i was making more money from cartooning and then by the end of it i remember i looked at my bank because i had direct deposit and i was like how much did i get paid and it was like 250 dollars. so i was like fuck this i <laughs> i was like i'm not going i'm not going back in and making sandwiches my during time, lunch rush again for this much money man my time is not worth this and that's the thing you get older your time becomes more valuable you know and when you start I mean, I can imagine today a minimum wage hasn't gone up in over a decade and sure, yeah. to get paid seven twenty-five an hour, whatever it is for, and people don't understand how difficult those jobs are. Yeah, they suck. I mean, working, working pizza delivery and making pizza that, I mean, I had a good boss, so nothing against, nothing against him, but that job fucking sucked. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you make, you make what's essentially pennies for for the amount of effort you put into it so mm -hmm. it's like to not to not have any kind of wage increase in the last decade and a half is is 
not only insulting, it's like it's dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. Because it was bad enough making that money at the time when it actually was worth more, you know? Yeah, well, they kept raising the rents too because it was Denver. Yeah, and the rents, it was Denver, especially, yeah. So, you know, in, the, in your my job, like I had to be there at 5 30 in the morning. It's so like getting up so early. It would end up like winter. I'd wake up and it'd be a blizzard outside and it'd be pitch black and I'd be walking to work because I didn't I didn't have a driver's license. And that's my experience just, in Chicago. Dude, every you could just look in everybody's apartments and their their lights were off because they're all asleep. They're all cozy in their beds. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> trudging through the snow, getting like <laughs> blasted in the face with like ice. When I first moved to Chicago, I, I you would think I'd be able to find a job, but I, I, I applied and applied. And I couldn't find anything. And finally, I applied at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, they have health insurance. You know, maybe maybe if I get a job there, at least I'll be insured. And, uh, I did get a job at Starbucks. They offered it to me. I, 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 I uh, interviewed at a store not far from where I was living in, uh, in Wicker Park or Bucktown, Logan Square area. They're like, OK, you're going to work. You're going to work in, in the loop. And I was like, oh, great. So I have to travel down the loop. I not only was it an incredibly difficult job with, it was in a bank building mm -hmm. and we were across from district headquarters. So uh, I'm making the story too long, but I'll just go ahead and oh, no. push it right through. So it, it, we were the model store of the whole district, which is like one quarter of the country. So we had to do everything perfectly. So then even for those reasons, it was a nightmare job and it was in a bank building. So everybody that came down were these wealthy bankers that never tipped. Uh -huh. So it was, a, it was a shitty job anyway, but every morning I had, I, I would hop on a bike and ride a half hour down Milwaukee to the loop. And there would be like snow and rats the size of dogs and, and people throwing things at me. And I'd be like, I'm doing this at 3.30 in the morning so I can make <laughs> 7.25 an hour, you know, or whatever it was, plus minimal, <laughs> hardly any tips. And that's that was another uh, wake up for me. I was like, I really need to make comics work because I can't do this much longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so similar to me, I was just like, I can't, you know, I remember, yeah, that, that same feeling is like a desperation. Like I need to make comics work because otherwise I'm going to be here at Panera Bread and I don't want to be a manager. Like what? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like management does not appeal to me. It's like, I want nothing to do with this. Yeah. I've the older I got, the less I could deal with management too. You know, whether they were nice or not, I just, I don't like, I don't like doing what people tell me to do. I, I'm, uh -huh. I'm, I'm too, I'm too independent of a mind and I, I start getting an attitude and it starts getting me in trouble, you know? So I just like, I have to make this work. And even, so now like I, I, you know, you know, with independent comics, there's, there's not much income in it, but I'm happy, you know, it's a, uh, so it, it's just, and then jobs like that really help put things in perspective. It's like, you want to make it in independent comics, go work at Panera Bread or Domino's Pizza for a couple of years. That'll, yeah. that'll, that'll get you to do it. But you sell your originals too, right? That's another, that's, sort of that's one of the main ways I have income. Yeah. And that and originals are, beautiful man because you still work on paper <laughs> and you use blue pencil you know i can see the, i can see the benefit of why people work on tablets uh because when i do cleanup especially for or I, uh, on the uh, on my on these pages it just it streamlines the process so much and if i i don't do much freelance illustration but what little i do sometimes i will do it on a tablet just for fun it's easier but at the same time i, I like if I'm going to put all for my personal work, and this is how I view it, is my personal work, I'm going to do it the way I feel it needs to be done, which is still physical media, you know, uh, pen and ink on paper. And I, nothing beats it for me. I, I, uh, I just don't care to, I don't care to draw on the tablet. I, I can see the benefits and I can see why people on a deadline would do it, but it's not for me. Yeah, I'm the same. And Jim, I always think about Jim Woodring, who said, you know, you labor and labor on this drawing, on this art. And at the end of it, then you have nothing. Like he's like, when exactly. I, I I work really hard on these pages, and at the end of it, I have this beautiful piece of art that's like a real. Page. And I'm the same. And and because I have to make a living by selling these things. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Yeah. I you know I I, I could sell prints, but I'm not going to be able to sell them for what I can sell an original page for. Yeah. So if I have to make this work, I have to keep I have to keep producing the physical pages. You know, I was talking to a class at the Kansas City Art Institute and. Uh, they were asking like the standard questions like how do you make a living at this i was like well i i sell my art and looking across the room everybody's sitting there drawing on ipads or whatever and i realized i said the wrong thing because these 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 kids uh i start, starting to sound like an old man kids these days <laughs> but, but yeah i felt i kind of felt bad for him because yeah it's it's a nice way it's a way to draw quickly and and to correct quickly and 
et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, what do you really have to show for it be beyond a, a file, you know? Yeah. And we're from, I mean, we're two guys that are like inspired by a lot of like historic cartoonists and the, the, oh. the craft of being a cartoonist in this like classical sense, which involves using the materials that, that our favorite artists used. So yeah, you know, I, when I first started out, I was, I would look at the artists I respected and, uh, and you know that's that's kind of what drew me to nibs in the first place when I was a uh, when I was a, a younger person just that and they looked neat you know the idea of dipping ink and the whole process really appealed to me and uh, and uh, yeah it's uh, I don't know maybe if I was going to school a freshman in freshman in college and art art department right now maybe maybe it would be different maybe maybe I would be working more digitally but it's it's I'm sure it's a generational thing as well but. Uh, as it is, I'm not going to switch midway uh, for something that I don't even really care for. Do you do you pencil out your entire book before you ink it? Is uh -huh. that yeah, I, and I do type pencils too. I can't I can't ink unless I do type pencils. So basically, I draw the book twice, uh, and which isn't uncommon. But I've tried to loosen up with my pencils and stuff, and and with certain sequences like abstract sequences and stuff, I'm able to be a little more free. But I'm when it comes to characters and stuff. Uh, I think I was telling you about we were eating we were eating a meal one one day after uh, after Col after the Columbus show uh, and uh, well that's a I'll, that's a tangent I won't I won't go down that road well, but yes I, you, how you work you were asking me how I get all the faces to uh, look the same look the same and as I get it's, be it's because like if I'm doing a three hundred and seventy page book if you draw a character that many times they're gonna change you mm -hmm. know. And it's, it's usually just very small changes, like the eyes or the eyes come a little closer together, or maybe the nose drops, or maybe it's a little little larger or something. But uh, after drawing a character for 360 pages, uh, plus or minus, uh, they change a lot. So with now, I can once I finish the pencils, I can go back through and make minor adjustments, or I can just do it with the ink that way. Uh, if I inked right from the get-go, then, then I would have to do, again, it goes back to like, compulsion I, I it, it doesn't bother me so much when other cartoonists I see I as a cartoonist I can see the changes in other people's art but it doesn't bother me mm -hmm. uh, but in my own I feel this need for it to be consistent and because because I have this like compulsive need for consistency uh, I, I, I pencil everything first yeah but when you're penciling it you're writing it right I mean that's also the writing process when you're penciling it all out or it is all scripted first I don't write a script, but I do. I don't. I don't. I don't write as I go. Uh, in some sections, especially, it depends on what what part of the story I'm working on. Uh, the uh, the guy wandering through the desert in the first book. That stuff, I, I I pretty much I have an idea of what I want to happen, but I I allow for more uh, serendipity in that in those stories. But the story where the stories well, in the first book on the space station, I I. Since I want to tell a very specific story, I, I know there are points that need to be made. Mm -hmm. So I do at least write to the, I don't write it to death, but I do write to the point where I make sure I follow a certain path or arc to make sure I get from point A to point B without missing anything. Yeah. Uh, and there are, there are I, dialogue, I'll write down like a general idea of what I want the dialogue to be. But I find that once I get to know the characters better, the dialogue changes considerably. It's almost that when I'm drawing the characters, I'm also, acting them out yeah, so when i'm acting out the faces you hear you hear like their dialect you hear their voices and uh, and uh that or how they would react to another character they're speaking to you know and that and that changes along the way so i i allow for for changes organically but i also before i go into um i do quite a bit of writing just to make sure i have an understanding of what the story is yeah see that that makes sense to me but it's like i i wondered if you were if you if you had penciled the story and then when you were going back through to to ink it again, if you suddenly realize oh there's a better way to problem solve this like you know there's a, a better way to go about this scene or something and then you have to redraw. By the something. time I get by the time I get to the drawing point point of drawing, I have a pretty good idea of what I need it to be. That there's not a whole lot that I find that ends up on the cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. uh, there are pages. Uh, definitely panels here and there, but mainly pages. Like there's a ten page sequence that I did in this new book. That I, you know, it, how it take, takes a month to draw ten pages, just about about. Uh, but once I went back to look at it after after uh, a few months, I had inked it too. 
I just, I was really unhappy with it. So I went back through and redrew and restructured that 10 pages to a point where I felt it was better. But uh, wow. so it happens occasionally. Um, but for the most part, uh, like I said, I allow for wiggle room, but, and if I'm going back through and inking, uh, maybe the dialogue looks a little clunky or I could do something different. I might change dialogue, but otherwise I don't, I don't change the images too much. Uh, once it's down, it's, it's to a point where I'm happy with it. On, yeah. with pencil. And you draw nine by 12? I draw them nine by 12. Yeah, I just, I got lucky that they make nine by 12 pads and it happens to be in proportion to the to the book I'm working in. So I don't have to cut. I used to do illustration board for skyscrapers. Yeah. And uh, it's a little bit, it adds a couple extra steps, a couple more extra steps than I would want to uh, do anymore. I, I mainly work on Bristol now. Yeah, it's expensive to get illustration board. It is. And to get illustration board shipped, that's not damaged. And I don't live anywhere near an art store. So I knew I was going to, when I figured out that Nottaway is going to be around 1800 pages, I was like, I'm going to have like a room full of stacks of illustration board if I do the, if I go this route. Because skyscrapers is only 280 pages, somewhere around there. And it, it, when I had all those pages, it took up a considerable amount of room in a closet. You know, it's like, I can't, there's no way I can make an 1800 page book on, a, on illustration board. Have you sold off a lot of that artwork? From skyscrapers? skyscrapers yeah i'd say over the years i've probably sold three quarters of it uh, and yes i wonder skyscrapers i remember when i was getting into comics around 2006 or seven or something when i started publishing my own stuff skyscrapers was a pretty popular indie comic like it definitely had a reputation when i was getting into the comics i think i think i, I owe all that to ad house you know it's uh it's uh Ad chris was just he was the right publisher at the right time for that book I was very fortunate to uh, to have him pick it pick it up. Uh, it won the uh, I, I was self publishing after after that trilogy fun I did I I wanted to do a one man anthology. I had different I ideas uh, stories related to childhood, and uh, I, uh, I I can't I couldn't tell you how I, I can't remember uh, the, how I came up with the title skyscrapers in the Midwest. Uh, why I know. Okay, I'm going off on a tangent again. Sorry, oh, I, I, I tend to do that. No, uh, skyscrapers. Uh, the title it came from me uh, i was always kind of obsessed with grain towers growing up and they were they were the skyscrapers of my childhood so since the anthology was childhood stories i named it skyscrapers of the midwest but um i had uh, i did that first issue and i heard i was like okay how can i how can i get this i was happier with it than i was with fun i was like okay I'm, i think i'm ready to show people my stuff beyond friends and family and uh i was trying to figure out a way i could get a broader audience because it is before social media, uh, you know, you still had to kind of like get get books into people's hands. Yep. Um, and the Isotope out in San Francisco uh, had the Mini Comic Award, so I sent it out there, and uh, they just won. It happened to win. I got I got really fortunate. Uh, and uh, a few months after that, I, I had finished. I was like, okay, so momentum's going. I, I'll I'll write a second issue and I'll take it to a show out in New York City. I'd heard of Mocha, so I was like, I'll go out there and see what I can do out there. Mm -hmm. And I was out there, I brought the second issue with me and I was standing in line to uh, get Adrian Tomine to sign a book for me. And stand next to me was this like, uh, this guy that, that was losing his hair. And uh, he looked down at my, my books. I had skyscrapers with me. I was gonna give one to Tomine. And uh, he's like, hey, you're, you're, just, you're the skyscrapers guy? I was like, yeah. He's like, I heard, I heard, you know, I heard about it through the isotopes. He's like, can I have a copy? And I just handed him a copy. Wow. And, uh, couple weeks later it was, it, he emailed me it was Chris and I just happened to be standing next to him in line and he saw he saw my book and he really took it from there uh yeah with, uh, with skyscrapers I wh whatever level of popularity it had um he was just really good at at putting out a great looking book and people responded well to Chris he's such a kind nice person mm -hmm. and professional and and, he, and his books are look fantastic uh the, on the production side of things and it just uh but it was a comic series, right? That, that he published at first, wasn't he? He took my he took my first two mini comics and put it in one in the first issue. Okay. And yeah. At that point, I had no idea how long I was going to do skyscrapers, whether if it was going to be like an eight ball type thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, or if I was and do it indefinitely until you know twenty issues are done or whatever, or if um, I didn't know what was going to happen. But he's like, well, why don't you just make some bigger issues, the same size as this one, and we'll we'll see what happens. And I. Once I had the second issue out, I, I th and the third issue, I think I realized I wanted the fourth one to be the final. So I kind of wrapped it all up. And, and by that point, 
people were coming to shows uh, in the mid 2000s, later 2000s. And uh, he would give like Mocha or SBX, he would try to give people copies of books for review and they wouldn't take skyscrapers because they said they didn't take anything with staples. Oh, so, so he's like, okay, well, we'll just collect it. So when uh, when the four when the four issues uh, were finally out by the end of two thousand seven, we started working on the collection. So it I went in like six seven years from like self publishing to like this beautiful hardbound book, which is you know wasn't in wasn't my plan at all. But um, um, with Chris's direction, it, it I, I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't met Chris. I imagine my then my, my path in comics would have been totally different. I, I probably would have done a couple of skyscrapers and then tried something else out, you know? Was that, did you have uh, the idea of, of skyscrapers um, be, like forming a bigger story when you were working on it? Or what, did you think you were just doing a comic of? Initially, it was just a one man anthology. I had no idea it was going to turn into a bigger story. But once I realized, once I had the opportunity with Chris to create more issues, yeah, I, uh, I saw the opportunity to connect some of the dots from the first two mini comics and then and then oh, make okay. a little bit of a bigger story out of it but it was never intended to be you know a graphic novel that wasn't my intention from the beginning it just it kind of ended up that way yeah but you were just kind of throwing in all sorts of stuff from your childhood and then yeah I, and i had plenty of things i wanted to write about and you know the fantastic aspects it was it was fun to it was fun to do and it was also i found like i was telling you earlier uh, comics tend to be cathartic for me or maybe i wasn't telling you that early but uh <laughs> But the catharsis I was finding through getting, you know, like every kid has their childhood problems, but I was, I was, I had the, I had the fat kid problems. I was always the one saying, even though I wasn't that. You were a fat kid? Well, I wasn't really obese, but I was still in, in my group. I was, I was the fat kid. So yeah, I, I had fat kid, fat kid issues. And I found that, uh, I found that working through them in skyscrapers was getting them out of my head. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it anymore. And I, I realized like, I want to keep doing this where I can, where I can draw, I can create and, and just get my problems out on paper. And I don't have to, they don't have to loop in my head anymore, you know? And the, that's what led to Driven by Lemons. I was just, I was, I was treading, barely treading water, barely keeping my head above the water. And I was like, I have to find a way out of this. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, skyscrapers took care of this problem. Maybe I can do something and take care of that problem. And that's how, kind man, of how fun was that in that era when you were doing skyscrapers and like, you could go to conventions and people were like, oh, it <laughs> It's like all of a sudden, like you had something that you were known for as a cartoon. It was, it was, uh, you know, to be an artist, uh, it was great to to have that kind of audience and to connect with that kind of audience. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I don't I, if I if skyscrapers was to come out today, I don't think I would have had the same experience. No, no, would, no, no, no. Yeah, it was just right for its time. I think. Yeah, I think you so know? too. It just uh, it all came to to a head in the right way. And and it was turned into a play too, wasn't it? Oh yeah, it was in uh, Columbus actually. Uh, the Available Light Theater adapted it. A guy named Matt Slaybaugh. He uh, he he flew actually. He flew out here from Columbus and he spent a few days with me, just interviewing me, asking me questions. And I walked. It was right after the fire, and we just moved back, so I had all this time. So we just walked around the farm, and we would talk about you know childhood stuff. And I was showing my grandma's house, which is just right down the road, and all the things in the book. And and uh, he uh, spent a few days, and he went back and took took a few months to write it and, and yeah I uh, I uh I went out there to see the show uh one one for one weekend and it was it's a strange of experience as you can imagine I always think of that Harvey the Harvey Picard movie do you remember oh, yeah. what that was American what that was? Splendor uh was it yeah no, American, it was just American Splendor wasn't it American oh. Splendor? <laughs> uh but yeah it was kind of that experience I I yeah almost like an out-of-body experience I didn't You're know how there to there and people on stage game. playing you and your brother what so i want to know are you do you take any break in between uh not aways or are you working on the next one already after i finished volume two back in february mm -hmm. i took about two months where i uh i didn't do much at all besides read uh watch movies and things i wouldn't play video games things i wouldn't really let don't have a whole lot of time for i mean i have time to do those things but just in excess i love to sit there and read and listen to records that's like my favorite thing in the world and you know, when you have to work every day, it's, um, well, I don't want to call it work, but when you're in the studio, when I'm in the studio every day focusing, um, it's not something I can do so much. So yeah, I took a two, couple months just for mental health to allow myself to reset a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, back in May, I started writing again. And, uh, you know, about three months in, I'm, I'm the, the story's, the story's starting, to, starting to take a, a more solid form. 
like I, ha I have I've, all along I've had an idea of what needs to happen in the story and who the characters are mm -hmm. but until I sit down to write I a lot of things I don't anticipate happen and that's my favorite part of writing is is uh allowing for the surprises you know the serendipity so the next so not away volume three is in a notebook somewhere right now it's not on it's in a notebook and uh I also got kind of got in the habit of I do some typing too because I found it's easier to edit with typing if I have I have sketchbooks where I do a lot of the original notes in writing but then I'll start writing in the margins, the notes, and then I'll put notes on top of the notes. And before long, it's barely even legible for myself. Uh, so uh, while there are sketchbooks and notebooks full of stuff, I've I've I just started like typing stuff up in the computer just so I can copy paste, move this around. And it's a little easier for me to read. Maybe it's me getting older and and needing needing uh, needing more clarity, um, possibly. But uh, I feel a little a little weird working on a computer, which is strange because I've been like writing in notebooks so long. But uh, it's just I, I pretty much my process is I, I do whatever I need I need to do to make it work. Yeah, well, that's cool, man. I'm really excited for the second volume of Not Away. I'm going to have Eric Reynolds send me a copy. Please and, do. Uh, I'm excited for it, man. But I, I took up uh, more time of yours than I even intended. So I, I'm going to let you go with an apology and a thank you. Bye.